Buyers are so much better prepared than ever before. Is that an excuse for some salespeople? Lazy salespeople will hide behind email. Keyboard warriors, Sweet. right? The seller will go, you're mad. Liking the sound of your own voice, is that ego? To, is it more than smart? Ways. Is it smart and ambitious? That's or a really I, good question. I, I, learn what did Bob do to be successful and model it. It's the first thing I learned in sales 24 years ago is every Thank prospect you meet, they've got a whiteboard above their head that says it's all about me. It was Nelson Mandela said, you never lose, it's you win and you learn. Then Thierry Henry, correct, <laughs> correct. <laughs> Success leaves footprints, learn from them. So can you teach an old dog new tricks? Well, evidently, yes, you can. This session is all about modern selling and influencing, and it just turns out there is a way to get hold of people. It turns out the referrals done this way is way better. Tony Morris, who is he? Well, he's a family man turned sales guru. He's from Hertfordshire and he taught me loads. Now, can he do the same for you? Let's find out. Let's do this. All right, Tony, let's talk about sales and sales performance. So what's let's the biggest it. challenge that you see at the moment in sales? Biggest challenge is probably getting a hold of people is always been a challenge and it's it's getting so, worse and worse. Why? Be because people are hiding behind um, their social profiles now. I think, you know, cold calling, they say cold calling is dead. I, I don't agree with that, but I do agree you need to warm the prospect up. But in order to do that, you've got to know where they're based. Right. Because I believe we should put something in the post first. That's I like lumpy mail. Um, but I've still got to get them on the phone. There are software out there like Lusher, Rocket Reach that normally scrapes data yep. to get the mobile. But that's probably the biggest challenge, actually getting someone on Rocket the phone. Rocket Reach, Cognizant. That that's right. It. Yeah. So these tools are often pretty good, but getting hold of someone is still one of the biggest problems because if you can't speak to them, you Love can't it. pitch them. All right. So getting hold of people is, mm. big, is a big problem right now. Any mm. other any other challenges in sales right now? So the way definitely things have changed, I think COVID has made things better in terms of you can now do more meetings, which is right. great. Um, however, it's I still prefer face-to-face. -face. I think most people do to build real rapport. Um, but I, I think, so that's a positive that we can actually now have 10 yeah. meetings in a day rather than three or four face-to-face. -face. But I think the other challenge is buyers are so much better prepared than ever before. They now say that buyers are 60% through the buying process by the time you first speak to them. So your knowledge has to be to another level to better educate them and add value. And, and I think, look, in a way it's a good thing because salespeople now can't blag. They've actually got to be genuine professionals. You've got to have the skills top. now, hey? Yeah, you really do. Now it's about, you know, now you're showing your value, your worth. So I think it's a positive thing, although some salespeople who have blagged in the past will find that a frustration. Any other challenges? Getting hold of people, buyers are more educated. Any other challenges right now? I think more players are in the market. So now, you know, sometimes competition. you're the competition. So your product might be seen as a commodity. So it's probably a little bit harder to differentiate yourself and how to articulate, you know, your value proposition. Right. Obviously, that's something I teach and help people with, but that is difficult. So take Action Coach, you know, there's a lot of other coaches, mentors yeah. out there. So what? why should someone invest X thousands of pounds with an Action Coach rather than all the other competitors? Got it, well, let's, let's go over each of those, yeah, all right? So, so getting hold of people, how do mm. we overcome that right now? Mm. I think you gotta think outside the box. So I think I like to find out where someone's based. That's quite easy online to find out their address, office address. Send them something in the post to warm them up. I think it's quite easy to get their email address. And yeah. I use BombBomb Bomb as my platform yeah, to do videos, good. which is pretty cool. So I send a video, so they're more receptive to a call. And then like, like we touched on, I use either Cognizum. I quite like Lusher. I think that seems to be the best tool, which scrapes data from LinkedIn Premium. And normally you get a mobile number. There is a little trick I teach actually to get a mobile and it's a bit cheeky, but you phone up, let's say either the PA or a an influencer and you say, look, James, hope you can help. I've got Tony Morris's mobile, but it's not connecting. Can I read the number I've got? And then you can help me. So you read out 
any number and they often say it's totally the wrong number <laughs> you need blah 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 and but it's the, cheeky but it works okay got and it. the truth is i i believe we're there to add value and to help people so as long as i can have two minutes of someone's time yeah. to demonstrate where i can help them they're grateful for my call anyway now getting hold of people mm. so you, you you've neatly shown us a way to overcome mm. that i'm just going to go the opposite way for a second yeah please is that an excuse of some salespeople that as probably. well, probably, yeah, probably, if, if, I'm, and I mean it in the best, in the nicest of ways, yeah, because it, there's a reality there, it's, yep. it's actually tougher to get older people right now. Mm. Um, Salespeople are lazy, so you know, pr- basically, they're lazy so, often. So, they you're absolutely right, they could be saying, I've tried, I've tried, but then if they're managed properly, they're using a CRM, and we can track now, yeah how many times they've actually tried, who they've tried. And there's other techniques to find out other stakeholders. So if you can't get hold of one, you'd like to get hold of one of the stakeholders. All right, so the buyers are more educated then. Mm. How do we overcome that? Be more educated than them. You know, you're the expert. So I think there's plenty of insights that can still be shared. So the buyers are more educated about what they're buying. Yes. Are you saying be more educated about them than their stuff? Both. About what they're consuming. Both. <laughs> so definitely. So understand their company almost as well, if not better than them. Really understand how do you do the market. That? I mean, how, yeah, I would. Research. So one of my biggest markets is property, real estate. And I trained over 350 estate agents. And people said to me, Tony, you know, which agent did you start your career with? And I said, I've never been an agent. And they literally don't believe me. But I, I have studied real estate in the UK so well that I could, you know, without being arrogant, go out and sell a property, right? But I, I know all the techniques because I've, I've observed, I've practiced, I've, I've developed models that have been rehearsed, 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 rinsed and repeated, and they work. So I, so when I go in with an agent, I can teach them very quickly how to triple their stock level. But I can equally help a buyer or a vendor or a seller. I can educate them on the market without even being an agent. And that that builds immediate trust, credibility. And they're more likely to work with me or the agent. Is it, you, you, you did mention on this point earlier on about differentiation. Yes. Are there any key little things that people need to start with on this, you know, mm. this competitive landscape? Yeah. Yes, there is. So a lot of people talk about a USP, right, unique selling point. I've got a bit of an issue with that because it might be unique, great, yeah. but we're using it to sell and no one likes to be sold to. So that's right. Really. So if you think about the selling point, that's serving us, not the customer. Yeah. So I think it should be a UCB, a unique client benefit. So we need to truly understand what, what's vital to our buyers. And I say buyers because it, there's often multiple stakeholders, depending on the size of the business, the size of the product service. And we need to know their priorities. And that's all about really good questioning and really good listening. And once I know that, I can then articulate the relevant UCBs based on their priorities. I, lo- I love that U- UCBs because I've mm. heard of you know val- um, USP is unique selling, selling proposition. Point, yeah, UVP unique value. Yeah, proposition. yeah, absolutely. So, so now you, you've taken that to it to- because it's all about them. It's the first thing I learned in sales twenty four years ago. Is every Benefit. prospect you meet, they've got a whiteboard above their head that says it's all about me make it about them and the second they think they're being sold to they actually get very defensive so, so let's give me an example of a unique client, client benefit, benefit. Yeah. yeah great question so let's take my business i run a sales training company one ucb is we with every retained client we have a whatsapp group or a slack group so their team have instant access to me so anytime one of the sales people have a challenge a problem a question they have instant access to me so when i'm next available i can respond so i'm seen as an external coach and my fees, are, I'm not cheap. So that individual salesperson is, is being massively invested in to exceed their goals. And that's a big US, UCB. You know, WhatsApp, Slack, it, there is something instant about that compared yes. with emails now, isn't it? Has Definitely. email gone? No, it depends what you're using it for. I think, again, lazy salespeople are hide behind email. Keyboard warriors, but, right? So some businesses now, you can go on the website mm. and you can literally get into a WhatsApp conversation yeah. as part Agreed. of their sales process. So I think that's becoming more dominant now than email. I really do see it going like that. And then I think video messaging is becoming even more popular now than a normal written message. So for LinkedIn outreach, I always recommend doing a personalized video 
but also I send video business cards for any prospect I want to work with. They'll get a video business card in the post, followed by a phone call. Yeah, I mean, even your family calls, you know, in the past, like to even 10, 15 years ago, FaceTime was there, but yeah. people didn't use it so much. No, no it's, it's not. It's the way around. You you always COVID, call your right? parents on a video. Absolutely, call. COVID. It's that's it's everything is video now. I think Jeb Blunt talks now that since COVID, seventy eight percent of prospecting should start with a video to warm. Seventy eight percent. Seventy eight percent. He believes. So I don't know about the other twenty two, but he believes seventy eight percent of prospecting starts with video content. Sticking on sales performance, mm. you did mention two big priorities. Mm. Massive priorities on sales performance: questioning and listening. Yep. Which one do you want to go with first? Go with questioning first. Where is that? So I've written a talk called Ask Better Questions, Get Better Results. And what I find with most salespeople, they don't have the will to even ask the question in the first place, but massively don't have the skill to ask it in the right way. And I've, I've worked with 38,000 salespeople. I've listened to, I can't even remember how many sales conversations. And most often they're asking really bad questions, but expecting the right answer. Is it will or courage? Is it mm. because surely a salesperson going into a meeting, their intentions mm. surely are positive, or they you know yeah. they want to ask some good questions. But, but when they get to it, do they bottle it? I think so. I think they they're scared of being seen as desperate, pushy, um, having commission breath. I call it. I think they're scared of that. I mean, they they are sort of eighties, nineties connotations yeah. of sales aren't they pushy yeah. sales and unfortunately it's some salespeople, especially in sort of the car sales industry it's still seen like that unfortunately and estate agents are not seen as good salespeople, pushy frustrating salespeople. so i think you know one thing i train on is actually asking better questions and i call them killer questions and once you know ultimately your best set of questions you can keep using those pretty much Tell every you time who also uses that? Phil Heskeff. He, yes, yeah, I love he, Phil. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's got Phil's this little awesome. business card and you yeah. just pause out like this and there's 50 killer yeah. questions on it uh, for does. salespeople. But yeah. He's great. Phil, he's great. So, so go on then. Give me one of your killer questions. Yes. Okay. So let's say I want to know, are you a decision maker? Often a salesperson will say, you know, is this your decision? Can you sign this off? They might go, yes, I can. It's the wrong question because it doesn't mean they're the only person that can. Yeah. So I'll say, you know, aside from you, who else will be involved? And you'll say it's me, Sarah, and, and yeah. Mike. Then I do a justification statement. I say, look, I need to meet you, Sarah, and Mike. You're all going to have different questions. I'm going to want to answer those so together you can make an informed decision. So that increases my probability of securing a meeting with the three of you. If I only meet you, you are now selling my product to Sarah and whoever else I said, Mick. And we can't have that because it's all about probability. So the, the key question at the beginning is, aside from you, who else will be involved in this? And your follow-up to that question, because mm. what I got from that was confidence. Mm. Well, this guy's got a structure here. He's, yeah. he's got a process that we're following yeah. here. Um, makes sense. I'm not, it's mm. irrefutable, really, the mm. point that you made, because you're all going to have different questions Correct. that you'll want me to answer. And it becomes very difficult to challenge, right? So I'll give you another killer question. I mentioned earlier that because there's so many competitors, um, you they struggle to differentiate, and often price then becomes the differentiator, yeah. right? Which you never ever want. But if it does fall into that, there's a way you can question out of it. So let's say you're an estate agent, and let's say your fees two percent, and the seller will say two percent, right? Yeah, well that's what they should be <laughs> commanding. The seller will go, "You're mad. They're one and a half percent. I'm yeah. going to go with them." Yeah. And you say, "Look, I appreciate that. If our fees were identical, who would you choose?" Now, if they choose them, you're stuffed, <laughs> but they won't. Otherwise, they wouldn't have raised the price objection. Exactly. So they'll go, well, I'd choose you, James, if your price was the same. And I say, look, I'm really pleased. Just for some feedback, why would you choose me? You zip up, and now they Let are selling sell you, you. Yeah, yeah. back to you. And you go, do you now understand why we come on that little bit more? Oh, it's genius. nice, right? So it's, it's that reverse psychology, because the best person to persuade themselves is themselves. Everybody listening right now is mm. just paying attention to exactly that point because it's real classic objection handling. Gives it again. Okay. So take price as a challenge, yeah. right? And this doesn't have to be real estate. It's anything, Yeah, but right? just give us that 1.5%. So, yeah, so if you're, yeah, so, you know, my fees are £10,000. I'm being compared to Crap & Co, who are 7000 yeah. right? And you say, look, I get that. Can I just ask, if price was identical, my fee was the same as Crap & Co, who would you choose? 
They will always say you. And you say, look, I'm really pleased to hear that. Just for some feedback, why would you choose me? And then they'll say things like, well, you've, you know, you've sold three properties like mine in the last month. Great, what else? Well, the, all of your sales team you've mentioned are all qualified. That yeah. does mean quite a lot to me and my partner. You say, great, do you now understand why we command that little bit more? And it becomes very hard to, to argue that. Yeah, love, love that little technique on objection handling there and price. Beautiful. Never, never heard that before. And I've Good. heard a lot of the stuff in sales. So questioning, anything else on questioning? Yeah, so I don't know why, but most salespeople start with closed questions. And if we look at closed questions, they're okay to clarify, you know, does that make is sense? Is this more salespeople or is this... The people. layperson. Is I this think the layperson. Is it an easier way? Is it the non-thinking about it? You know what? I, I actually don't know. You know, so I'm sure there's been psychology <laughs> studies this, right? I'm sure there is. But I just know sort of the default setting is closed questions. And then what, what's happening is we're getting so little from our prospect or yeah. customer. Yeah, yeah, true. We're sitting there thinking, God, they're hard work. And they're not. You're just asking crap questions. I'll give you another example. Take real estate. They'll say to a buyer, um, have you been looking long? Yeah. And have you seen anything you like? No. And they look at me, these salespeople, and they're like, God, he's hard work. Yeah. I was like, he's it's not. Like you just blood out of the store. Correct. So change the question. You've been looking a few weeks now. What's the best property you've seen so far? Yeah. And they'll talk about this lovely bungalow. Oh, yeah, I know that one on Cherry Close. What specifically attracted you to it? Now I've got you engaged. So it's about making a list of the key information you want to ascertain and extract yeah. And then designing killer questions around those. And you'll start just by process of elimination. You'll start to work out which ones get the most information. And you keep doing them. You just have them on repeat. Get them talking, open questions. All right, anything else on question before we move on to listening? Yes. The final mistake sales people make is they load questions. So they'll say, for example, um, what is it, what's important to you when choosing a company? Is it their fee? And the buyer will go, yeah, yeah, it's the fee. So I don't know why salespeople don't. I think they do it because they don't like silence. So when they ask an open question and they're not getting a response, you know, is it the fee? Whereas actually we ask the question, zip. Let that prospect or customer, let them process mm-hmm. it, let them think about it, then get feedback because they don't like silence either. Well, look, naturally we're already into listening here with silence and zipping, the magic zip, if you like. So... What stops salespeople listening? They like the sound of their own voice, pretty much. And what I notice with... Uh, that's an adage more than... But they do. ...belief, but, but surely. They, well, they, I, th- I think... Because, the, you know, when you get pe- salespeople mm. to listen to the call, I don't like the sound of my own voice. <laughs> yeah, they say that, yeah, yeah. but they do, right? They do. Their actions and, tell you they do. Correct. And I think the other mistake is they, most salespeople who are listening are listening to respond. They're not actually listening, whereas top producers listen to learn because the questions actually should come from the information that we get out of our prospect or customer, where often it doesn't. They're sitting there thinking, like, when's it my go? And then you're never going to engage. It's never going to be, you know, it becomes an interrogation, not a conversation. Is liking the sound of your own voice, is that ego? Yeah, I would say it is. Is ego important in sales? No, I don't think so. I think not conf- all. Well, I think you've got to be confident. I think you have self-belief. Is that ego? I don't know if that's ego. I don't think it is. I think you, you do, for a buyer to buy into you, you've got to have passion, yeah. belief. You've got to be confident, yeah. but you can't be arrogant. And there is a fine line. Yeah. How do you maintain mm. the right side of that line? Mm. Yeah, good, good question. How do you maintain? I think it's a gut feeling. And I think you have to gauge feedback from people because people don't really like arrogant people. So you yeah, need to you're gauge. right. I don't think people in the UK, especially like egos. Yeah. So I think therefore you need to sort of, you know, if you, you, if you are that sort of egotistical person and you're getting that sort of negative feedback, be it body language, IQs, whatever it might be, you're thinking, right, I've stepped over that line. I need to rein it in. Because it is hard, you know, if, if we, someone's knowledgeable, passionate and confident difficult we did an interview with mary portis recently mm. and she was exceptional and and basically what she was saying is you better be a decent human being mm. before you're anything else mm. 
you know, before you go into sales, you you mm. better have good values. You better Absolutely. be a decent human being. And, you know, that passion, belief, confidence, the question about, I asked about staying the right side, mm. that, that actually thought popped mm. up. Well, you've got to be authentic. You've got to be real. You've got to be genuine. You've got to be transparent. And a lot of sales people, unfortunately, I don't believe they are. And, and then what happens is they have commission breath and they become desperate. And, and that's Does that come with age, experience, wisdom? I think definitely age and experience helps. Yes, it does. And I think it's it's an inner confidence. Yeah, I think they, I think salespeople need to understand how they genuinely serve and help people. And when they know that, they should become very passionate about it. They should therefore be very confident in what they're saying and offering. And that's their personality, their real personality should shine through. Can anyone be a top salesperson? Or, that's or a really the, good question. Are, are, the, are the, you know, be, be mindful of this, this, and this before you choose, choosing to forge your career forward? I, so can anyone be a good salesperson? I, as running a sales training company, I would say yes, they can. But I would also caveat that with it's easier for, for a certain type of person to, to go into sales. Easier. However, that person or group of people where it's easier for them, they still need training. They still need help. And what I notice with the top 1%, they all have a coach. They've all got a mentor. They are all work in progress. Probably the top 1% in any walk of life. Yeah, agreed. So I remember I interviewed Art Subject, one of the first uh, books I read on sales called Smart Calling. He's now in yep. his fourth edition. He's amazing. He What's taught me name? that Art Subject. So he taught me the aside from you technique. Right, I read it from him. He's amazing. And I was interviewing him on my podcast and he said to me, Tony, no one graduates from the school of selling. I thought, I love that. And this is a guy who's been in sales 50 years. You know, he's self-made multi, multi-millionaire. It's so powerful, isn't it? But it's great, right? And it does. It makes you think he's got a really no fair graduates. point. No one graduates, you know, <laughs> and those that think they have normally aren't that successful. You know, because what you're saying is, I don't want to get any better than I am. Right. Let's move on to another area that you're really passionate about, which is productivity. Mm. What is productivity in sales? Where does it start and how, how do I so produce more Productivity more? for me is about working smart. And you know, if you look at any salesperson, we all have the same hours in the day, right? It's so time management doesn't exist because time yeah. is, yeah. So it's, I believe it's task management. So if you look at the best salespeople that are most productive, they just use their time smarter. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So any top producer, number one, when they're writing proposals, hopefully they've got a software so it's automated now, which I use better proposals. It's great. Cool, Quilla, yeah? Yeah. So it's the same one, isn't it? Same one. So, so that's the first thing. So you're making life easier so you can be more productive. The second thing is the time you're working on it should not be cool time. Because I could do it at 7 a.m. when I'm on the train, where I can't make sales calls really at 7 a.m. It depends on time zone and also on the train, bad so service. Outside of prime selling times. Correct. The other thing is the pilot doesn't serve drinks on the plane. So salespeople should be delegating as much as they can apart from their superpower, which is selling. So a, a really true sales professional, their role should be prospecting for new business, referrals from existing business, um, attending meetings be it virtual or face to face and that's pretty much it maximize the time 40 hours a week on that yeah and and i think you know look jeb blunt talks about blocking time blocking so yeah. you block which i totally get and he's got a do not disturb i'm in prospecting i love that i've got yeah, that yeah. my office door but it's you know i like power hours is that how it finishes do not disturb i'm in yeah so it's, it's do not disturb um i think it's do not disturb i'm prospecting yeah, yeah. something like that which i love but, and he talks about, you know, just one more call. But it's something most salespeople don't do. It goes back to a lot of salespeople are lazy, unfortunately. They want the, they want the easy fix. I'll tell you, Anthony Steer said that in an interview I did with him. When you've just booked that meeting mm. or you, you, you've just had that success, make two more call, uh, calls as soon as Definitely. possible. Definitely. He's right. Because the momentum, yeah. whereas most salespeople, I was with oh, a client two yes. weeks ago. Yeah. Thank God. And not even worse than that, I, I heard this one guy, Faz, he's a great sales guy, and he had a really good conversation. He didn't secure the meeting. Great conversation. He put the phone down, he went, and he started walking around the office. I was like, mate, what, what the hell are you doing? 
He's like, oh, I want to share it. I was like, share what? You had a good conversation. Get back on the phone, you idiot. He's like, yeah, fair comment. So whereas the one, you know, Ian, who's the most successful there, funny enough, doesn't do that. He's sitting there grafting and he's got his leads ready. So when he's doing his hour, he's not lead searching. He has his clear leads ready. He knows exactly what his goal is on every call. Uh, and he's prepared for it. So you, you were saying the, the PST or prime selling time, they, yeah. they, do you do it in hour blocks? I think so, but purely from an energy perspective. How many are there? Four a day. Two morning, two afternoon. Yeah, I would say so. A little break in between. A little break in between to check emails, priority emails, also to prepare leads yeah. for that day. Um, but in terms of when you're having a great call and then you've got to send an email with certain information, I'd highlight that and do that right at the end of the day. Yeah. I, I personally don't think you should be typing where on the phone. I suppose it depends on the product you're selling, the market you're selling into. So you've got notes there and you know during that day you put them onto whatever CRM use, high use HubSpot. Yeah. So you do that, but again, out of call time. Pretty, pretty popular these days is HubSpot. Yeah, HubSpot's great. The app's great, you know, it's, it's easy. Um, anything else then around productivity? You know, task management being the, you know what you call it about. Yeah. It's, so it's about. So I call it ROT, return on time. You've got to look at. You know, there was an amazing story, an amazing book called "Will It Make the Boat Go Faster?" Yeah, yeah. You know, Ben Hunt Davis, and I what, love it. What, that's what they had to say no to, yeah? Exactly that, right? And, and so the salespeople should be asking, "Will this earn me money?" Right? Will this earn me money? Because most salespeople, even the most experienced, are not going to be on more than probably 100K basic. Yeah, maybe a tiny bit more, but they're not retiring on their basic. And therefore, it's about the bonus, the commission scheme. And that's where they're going to make their money. That's where they're going to start to earn a million yeah. a year, you know, and upwards. Super professional salespeople. Um, therefore, every task they're doing, they need to be questioning that. Is, is this adding value to my pipeline? I suppose, look, when you start talking those numbers that you mentioned, the 100 grand, the million mm. a year, you start thinking about what can I delegate out? Here. Yeah. You start thinking about prospecting, referrals, attending meetings. I'm going to maximize my time on there. I'm going to do minimum Correct. amounts of that. And most salespeople, I say, why haven't you got a VA, like a virtual assistant? Like, oh, it's, it's 20 pounds an hour. I'm like, okay, <laughs> so why haven't you got one? I don't want to spend. I said, okay, well, let's just look at that, right? Let's work out your hourly rates. When you work out your hourly rate is, say, £150 an hour, <laughs> then why would you be doing a £20 an hour job when we just established that's your hourly rate? And then you say, yeah, can your VA make those sales calls? No. But can she, he or she type up those notes? Yes. There's your answer. So smart sales professionals will have a resource to delegate. And if they don't have the resource internally within their company... Then they find, you know, they find it, you know, with the likes of Upworks, Fiverr, there's enough skilled freelancers at your fingertips. To, Is it to more utilize. than smart? Is it smart and ambitious? Um, and yeah, hungry. well, you've got to have, look, you have to have drive and everyone's got different goals, right? Some people are very happy with a lifestyle business yep. where they're very happy to earn 250 grand a year. They don't want more than that because for them, it's more important maybe to have outside of work time which is great it all depends what your drivers are but i think if you're in sales often you're motivated by making money and doing something with that money yeah. and therefore to be successful you've got a graft it's never given to you you know a lot of sales people go oh, bob who's amazing well, he's got the big accounts but he's got big big accounts for a reason either he's acquired them or he's been given them and he's been given them because he's bloody good that's why he's got them. So, you know, stop being jealous. Just learn what did Bob do to be successful and model it, you know? Success leaves footprints. Learn from them rather than bitch and moan of why is Bob so lucky? He did say that earlier on, actually. Listen to learn. Mm. You know, I'd, I thought you were going to go with the I'm listen to understand. Please, you were listening. Uh, uh, please, you were listening. Uh, uh, I thought you were going to go with the listen to understand piece there. But, you know, learning's part of everything, especially oh, as, I mean, sales... I mean, it, it's so cutthroat, isn't it? It's, yeah. like, it's like sport. You, the feedback is given to you straight away. The result is the result. It's vital. Well, that's a really good point. So one thing I advise all my clients is when they win business, get feedback, you know, and say, look, it's not for my ego. I want to learn. Why did you choose me? Or why did you choose my company? Zip. 
get some feedback mm. because the narrative they're using, we could then use to other prospects. Testimonials. Exactly. And we can use it for marketing material because they'll use words that we maybe hadn't considered. So that's the first thing. But it's even more important when you lose. It was Nelson Mandela said, you never lose. He says, you win and you learn. So if you ever lose a piece of business... Nelson Mandela, then Thierry Henry. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Loved. That. I used to... I, my my mates are gooners, but yeah. But, but the, the key here, right, is where's the lesson? So I, when I'm coaching salespeople, I'm always like, when they do a bad call in there, right? I say, right, what did you take from it? Where was the lesson? R- where they're bitching and moaning that they didn't achieve their goal. Yeah. Say, great, you didn't get it, but what did you get? What question could we have changed to get a different outcome? They're not thinking like that. Whereas real professionals say, I had a great day today. Two things I learned actually to develop myself was A and B. Whereas most salespeople say, shit day, made no appointments. So they're focusing on what they didn't get as opposed to what they did get. What if you're a business owner? Yep. And you own the business, but you're doing some marketing, you're doing some sales, you're doing a little bit of hiring other people I can as relate well. To this. So this is a small business owner. What do they do? Because we've been talking like sales pros, mm. assuming they've got 40 hours a week. Yep. What about a business owner that's not got those 40? Yep. So they've got three options. Either they learn how to sell and sell, option one. Option two is they recruit a good sales person or then a sales team. Or three, they outsource. So there's a lot of outsource sales companies now. You've got to find the right one for your business, your product, your service, your market. But they're your options. I mean, I I don't really sell now for my business. I'm I'm the speaker for my company and I deliver some training. But, you know, my my price point comes at a premium so I have a team now of experts that deliver my brand my methodology you don't sell but you're prepared to go in the hot seat aren't you you're prepared to do live sales calls. yeah so for me it's not yeah yes I am but really I do it for a couple of reasons I do it to demonstrate everything I teach right because I have a methodology that I've created I know it works because I've tried and tested it thousands of times so I am prepared to stand in front of a thousand people make a live call to demonstrate everything that I've taught them and I don't always win, right? I'm human. But if I don't get the right outcome, I'm, I'm able to understand where it went wrong, right? And it's often my fault. But I'm able to pinpoint the question I asked that was wrong, maybe a statement I made that was incorrect, you know? And, and th- to me, that's a big skill for a salesperson. It's not just doing it right, but when it doesn't go yeah. right, observing that and understanding that. Yeah, very good. Let's talk on referrals then. Mm. You've, you've mentioned it a couple of times. Yeah. What's the secret to getting loads of referrals? Yeah, so there's two. One is ask. <laughs> Pretty basic. How? Ask. How do you ask? There's two ways, in my experience. So if you've got a... Um, well, I'll do it now with you, right? So you've been an action coach for nearly 10 years? Yeah. Yeah. What's your role at action coach? Um, I look after the coaches, so I make sure that the coaching is very high level for the, for the clients that we're coaching. Perfect. So you know I run a sales training company, mm-hmm. right? Predominantly, I work with estate agents, financial services, but ultimately companies that sell, okay? Imagine you and me swap jobs. So tomorrow you weren't an action coach, you ran Tony Morris International, this global sales training company. Who would be your first phone call to try and win your first customer? Who would you call? The people I know. Such as, give me an example, the first one that comes to mind that you would phone where they've got a sales team, they're either in the team, run the team, or on the business with the team. Who would be your first call? Action coach. Okay. And Where who, I am now. And who within Action Coach would you phone for the opportunity? The top dogs. Such as? Brad Sugars. Okay. So I'd love you to introduce me to Brad. And I'd like you to say, I know a very good sales training company, Brad, that you need to be speaking to. <laughs> That's how you do it. So by saying, if we swap jobs, you see the world through Whoa. my lens. So, yeah, it's real a, power, powerful story that, isn't it? Mm, and, and it works, but you've got to have the right rapport with someone. I knew I could get away with it with you. Yeah, yeah. Certain clients, it's different behavior personas. And maybe it's not right. So the, the first technique I really like is if we swap jobs. Because people do, they're like, okay, that's clever. I'd phone blah, blah. Well, they've got a creative it. journey like I just went on. Exactly, and we got to Brad Sugars, and, and we I'd didn't, love to speak we didn't to Brad. realize where it was going. I even did. though I asked the you question, did. I did. Yeah, yeah. sneaky, sneaky, Beautiful. little bit, clever, yeah. clever rather than sneaky. Fun. So the second way is if you feel that isn't right, it's called positive affirmation. So there's three steps to it. So the first thing you've got to get is positive feedback. 
because part of asking is the timing to ask. And I would recommend you ask when you've done something brilliant. So let's say you've helped a client and they're, they're absolutely ecstatic and they phone you, James, you're a superstar. Thank you so much. And I'll get great. It's my job. I'm delighted. Ken asks, we've been working together now a good few weeks. Feedback's important. How have you found your experience? Now, they've just told you you're great. So they're going to say, well, you're amazing, yeah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And you go, great, I'm really pleased. So look, James, most of my business actually comes from recommendations. With that in mind, who do you know? Friends, family, or previous work colleagues that I may be able to help? Who comes to mind first? Zip. Let them think about the thousand or so people they know. And then you're, they're likely to arrive at someone. So you load it for them. Family, friends, previous work colleagues. But, you know, salespeople should be even smarter than that. They should be on LinkedIn connecting with every yeah. customer, looking at the, their connections, finding out who, it, who in those connections really are on their hit list, people they'd love to serve. And then I'll say to you, James, I, I see you're connected with Brad Sugars. How do you and Brad know one another? Oh, well, he's my boss, blah, blah, blah. So I'd love to have a chat with Brad. And the reason I would is blah, blah, blah. Would you be so kind to introduce me? But the key is ask the damn question yeah. and, and choose the right time to ask the question. Asking time in positive affirmation as well, what you said yeah. there as well. You know, that's part of the timing. Yeah, of thing, course. Isn't it? But equally schedule it. Look, what gets scheduled gets done. So Andy Bounds taught me that. He said, Every Wednesday, I think he does on a yeah. Wednesday at 8 a.m., he has a, a schedule to say, ask for referral. I love it. becomes habitual. It takes about 21 days to become a habit. So now every Wednesday morning, wherever he is in the country or, or globally, he'll ask a client for a referral. And it's not, you won't just phone and say, listen, I haven't spoken to you for a while. You'll have a catch up. Yeah. How's the team? How's business? How's the family? Blah, 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 blah. Say something, James, I've never even asked you. And then you'd go into it. The technique that you're most comfortable with. Very creative ideas coming out of you right now. Good. All right, let's talk about self-development then. Mm. So, be, you know, becoming, achieving potential in sales. Do salespeople, the, the ones that you meet, do they have development plans, career development plans, personal plans in terms of the skills? The, 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 the super successful ones do. What kind of plans do they have? So they will have, um, so I use one called the 135, as in what's my ultimate goal? Let's say I want to earn a million pounds a year. What's the three things I'm going to do to contribute to that? Yeah. Let's say, for example, one might be fitness, yeah. one might be family, and one might be business. And then they break down five tasks for those three pillars. And those five tasks are the only things that ever change. But so they, they normally have something like that. They've got a a destination they want to get to with a timeline attached to it and that might be 12 months two years whatever and then they break that down of right what are the strategies i need to employ to to achieve that destination and then they break that down further into five tasks that are manageable and then it's a case of prioritizing those tasks hitting them and then going to the next on a one. daily basis yeah daily basis till it becomes habitual because I've got a podcast called Confessions of a Serial Seller, where I interview the best of the best. And what I start to see is common threads amongst is them. Is this like the million pound yeah. a year? Type? The likes of Jeb, yeah. Jeffrey Gittimer, Andy Bounds, etc., cetera, uh, and many, many more. And what I start to observe with them is they all have a mentor. They all are into development, mm -hmm. normally into fitness, normally into eating well. Um, yes, they might drink, they might smoke, they might have some bad habits, but they'll be minor bad habits, you know, mod in moderation yeah. normally. And it's no coincidence that all these top performers have more good habits than average performers. It's just not coincidence. So, you know, when you start to model them and you understand what they read, what they yeah. digest, what they consume, you start to see similar results. So to go back to your question is, yes, salespeople do, but it is always the top 1%. There's some sim simplicity in that mm. plan that you said. What's the one big thing? What are the three important Absolutely. areas? And what are the five key tasks? Under those three key pillars. So is that 15 tasks or is it five? Is no, it's 15. Overlap? It's 15. But, and it depends how you want to do it. So let's say in, in my world, I have um, speaking is one of my pillars that's yeah. going to get me to my £10 million a year goal. Then I have training, which would be my team of experts yeah. going out or me. And then I have my e-learning solution. 
Now I so I have a university, it's like a monthly yeah. subscription. So they're my three pillars that's going to get me to my ten million a year turnover. Um, and every week, every month, I will review the five things I'm doing in each of them. So that's sort of more of a business plan. I then have ones for my relationship with my wife, my kids, and my friends and, and family. I have one for personal fitness because you know I I, I want to keep fit, a to hopefully look good, to feel good, and also you know healthy. Well, they say healthy body, healthy mind, right? So for me, it's a non-negotiable. I, I work out four times a week. You couldn't tell, but I do. And I do it so I get into the right frame of mind. You know, I meditate every morning. I listen to an audio book, audio book every night when I go to bed. I do all these things habitually now because I know it yep. gets me into the best shape, you know, mentally and physically. It's a really, really neat way, simple way of looking at a development plan there. Now, even if... Even if the business, if I'm employed as a salesperson, even if the business or organization doesn't have that kind of structure in place, mm. suppose, suppose you can have your own notebooks. Of course you can. Your so, own pla- So one I recommend, I call it my success Bible. So I, ha- I have two. I have, well, I've actually got three. I've got a success Bible, a sales Bible, and a speaking Bible. But let's take the success Bible, because a lot of salespeople are lone wolves, right? They work remotely. Yeah. Um, and that's great, and, and they can, they're can they self-motivated because they're super successful, and they, they have strategies to do that. One of them is know what you want to achieve and have a plan to get there. Yep. That's the biggest strategy. But it can be quite a lonely place. And if I'm not massively into football, but the fact you said Thierry means you probably are, right? So if you look at any good football team, when the coach or manager goes to try and motivate them, they often do it in the trophy room, right? So they're surrounded by success. So for me, a success Bible is like your personal trophy room. Nice. So anytime you have any success, it could be your best win, it could be your best testimonial, your best referral, your best lesson. So it's not a win, yep. but it's a good lesson. All those things should go into your success Bible. So when you're having a crap day, crap week, bad month, you look back at it just to remind you you are pretty damn good. And it's that pick-me-up that we all need. I think it's need. important to keep up to date with you that. You have to. You have to. Do you, wrote, do you do it when the win comes or do you do it habitually, like the end of every week? Well, what well, have been my big successes? For me, week? it's when it happens. So yesterday my I got called by Wiley that my book's now gone to print. And that was like, oh, tick. You know, I've I wanted to have a be a Wiley publisher for quite a few years. I got the goal. Well done. It's a nice tick. Yeah, thank you. So that went straight into the success bible. I do it for personal as well. You know, my son, he's fifteen now, but when fingers crossed he passes his driving test, that'll be a success. So it's not just about me. It could be, you know, we're doing housework at the moment and we've you know we are getting some nice things. They're successes, you know, whatever that might look like. Just celebrate my mum's seventieth, we put on a massive seventieth for her. That was success. Because she was delighted, and, and that's key, you know. Got a number of quick fire questions. Please for that's go right. for it. What's your favourite book? Oh, so hard, as in sales book or any book. One sales, one of all time. Sales book, probably Sumo. Shut up and move McGee. on. Yeah. yeah, love that book. Um, for book of all time, that's really hard. It's a thriller I read called The Day After Tomorrow. And it was, I can't remember the author, it was nothing to do with the film The Day After Tomorrow, but it was about a, a sort of a cat and mouse around Paris. And it was up to the last two words in the book where you were like, oh, so it was edge of the seat through the whole thing. And the last two words, you were blown away. So for me, it gives me goosebumps just thinking of that book. So it has to be that book for personal um, yeah, and sumo, I think it's got to be up there. Shut up and move on. Yeah, Let love it. it. Yeah, look, um, Paul McGee, amazing. Yeah. Favorite movie? So hard, but Pursuit of Happiness. I, I love a true story. I love an inspiring story. And for me, Chris Gardner, wow, you know what a story. I read the book again. Gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. It's very emotional as a father. You know the scene where he's with with his son in the toilet, but to show what's possible. To go from homeless to a multimillionaire, wow. You know, his beliefs, his value system, you know, you can't beat that. Definitely a feel-good movie. Oh, it? the best. I've seen it 20 times. Favourite movie? Not movie, favourite music. I'm not madly into my music, but if I probably... The Unforgiven by Metallica. Always love that song. Yeah, so I, my music taste hasn't really changed... Well, I say it hasn't changed. I love Adele now. 
um, and that you know was she wasn't around when I was twenty, really into my music. But I still like Counting Crows, that sort of music. I still listen to that, but I'm not mad into my music. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? It's got to be flying. I mean, Superman, what a ledge. Yeah, it'd have to be flying. You can't beat that. Although I'm a bit scared of heights. So to be honest with you, I'd fly at maybe 12 foot. <laughs> Cause, yeah. Superman or Iron Man, the both fly. Who's Superman. Going? Always Superman, love Superman. Superman yeah. I'll join you. I'll be Iron Man next year. Done, <laughs> mate. Done. And I remember I actually saw Superman being filmed in Bourne Wood. So Bourne Wood's got a, Elstree Studios. And I remember I was a kid and my dad took me. And I was so scared because it was like 23 Supermen walking around. I was like, what? what is going on and there were extras but as a kid I didn't have a clue what that was so just men in red pants walking around everywhere it was cool it was a nice memory extras or stunt people or yeah <laughs> one or the other both uh, favourite holiday destination got to be actually the most recent South Africa we had Where did two you go? weeks we started right at the top went to uh, I can't remember the name of the safari but it was an unbelievable smaller one and went all the way down to Cape Town but it was like my dream two week bucket list holiday because we hadn't had a holiday like everyone for two nothing years. like taking some off the oh, bucket list it was it? ridiculous and you know with the two kids my wife it, it was how old are the kids 15 and 12 are they into sales funny enough harry is the 15 year old we're actually writing a book together called um selling through the eyes of a child so i basically explain sales to him and he explains it back from his lens but to be honest with you, trying to get him to write it is a nightmare. I reckon by the time it, we publish it, it'll be like selling through the eyes of a granddad, <laughs> to be honest. But he's, he's enjoying it, and uh, he wants to do what I do. So, yeah, that's the plan. Early bird or night owl? Early bird. Yeah. How early? Well, I get up at half five every morning to work out. So, you know, again, non-negotiable. Do that four times a week, because uh, I just prefer it. I think it's a nice start to the day. But I also work late as well, which I also quite like. You know, I'll be with a wife, watch some TV, she goes to bed, kids are in bed, and maybe about 10 o'clock I'll do a couple of hours work. I quite like, for me, it's Ten good thinking. Well. Yeah, n not every night, but probably three nights a week. Right. It's just good thinking time for me. It's, you know, it's quiet. Um, I've got my dog on my lap, and I just work. If you could have one day in someone else's life, past or future, mm. who would you choose? That's an amazing question. Who would I choose? Whoever Liz Hurley is dating at the moment, I'll probably choose that person. <laughs> Comes right. to mind straight away. Um, who would I choose? Probably Brad Pitt. I'd love, you know, A-list celebrity like him. I'd just love to see what the world looks like from his Why lens. Why did you choose Brad Pitt? I've always had a bit of a man crush on Brad Pitt. So fight I'm straight, club. but yeah, fight. fight Club, wow. Seven, I thought seven was pretty up there. Um, I've just, you know, that he's... But I actually imagine it would be quite a disappointment, I reckon, um, because, you know, as a big A-list celebrity, he probably hates the paps the whole time. Yeah. So, but, it, I'd, you know, I think that'd be quite interesting to see the world through his lens. And who've, be, who've been the three biggest trusted advisors in your life? So definitely my current one. So Graham Godfrey is yeah. known as a positive mind shift coach. He's coached me now for about a year. What, what, what do you Game get from changer. him? so much um, so he's he came on as a business coach I've, I've had coaches yeah. for 23 years but he's to me I've had the biggest change but he's now become more of a personal mentor so he, just my relationships in life and my mindset is at a different yeah. level so definitely him my late dad I lost my dad bless him 16 years ago 17 years ago he was 55 and it was three months after I set my company up and three months before I got married so it was bang in the middle of that so it was two life-changing moments for me or life-changing events what did, what did your dad help you cancer with? oh sorry what did he die of it what did he help me with he taught me to what it's like to work hard because he was a grafter yeah he taught me what it's yeah you know, it's what you said earlier about what Mar mary porter yeah. i think you said about being genuine being real yeah. beliefs valid my dad was like that you know really was like that and i think I, and i you know inherited that and my dad was an amazing speaker you know he he worked for ibm he would do presentations around the world and i remember as a kid just watching him practice i don't think i ever got to see him present apart from a speech at a wedding um but and he, he spoke at my engagement actually which was wonderful but hopefully i've inherited some of his skills you know but for me my goal is to retire at 55 so i've got 11 years and, and i'm doing that because dad never got to do that and i want dad to sort of see the world through my lens from that point on so that's my my why if you will and all right and the third one 
Um, I wouldn't say it's trust advisor, but my wife, she is amazing. Like, to be fair, to put up with me, I, I'm mental. So it's part of well, surely me. you trust her and she probably does yeah, offer some definitely. advice. Or... <laughs> yeah, she, she costs me a lot of money. <laughs> but but she is, she's, she is just the most amazing, super intelligent, the most unreal support to me, does give me such great advice. She, she reins me in and I need to. One of my... One feedback to myself is I'm so driven and motivated, but I'm and I'm an entrepreneur, but I tend to go with the next great idea, and I know I need to rein myself in and go, that's great, but it's not working yeah. towards the 10 million a year turnover, so I put it to the side for the moment, and I'm learning to do that more and more. And she hit, she's helping you with oh, that, massively. You back in. Yeah, yeah, she really does, and I listen to her. I value her opinion. All right, so if if it, or anyone listening right now. To this, if they could grab hold of one bit to start with, this is the bit that I want to learn from this session mm. and go and implement. What's the one biggest takeaway from what we've discussed that you want them to take? So I, I suppose, obviously, you've got to be in the world of sales, but I, and I think this is we're cheap. all in sales. Though. We're all in. We are. We are all in sales. It's a really good point. I think that the biggest thing is, and it's so cliche, but don't give up. And most people, sales in life, quit too early. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm a massive believer in, in the... So I think there's two, actually, if I may. One is never quit. Really, if you really believe you can add value to someone, keep going until you get there. And that's my first. My second is, I call it the whale. And what I mean by that is in my company, anyone who invests £100,000 with me on speaking or training becomes the whale. I've landed 37 whales now, but interestingly, 28 of those were tadpoles who knew the whale. And what I've realised, it's not who you speak to, it's who they know. And everyone you know knows someone you don't. And therefore, when we have those prejudgments we make when we speak to someone, we think, oh, they're too small for me, they're not worth my time. It's who are they connected with? Because yes, they might be small right now and it might not be the biggest opportunity right now. But number one, it could move to that. And number two, you don't know who they're connected with. And if you treat them with absolute world class and you serve them to the best of your ability, they're going to become a raving fan and introduce you to their network. And there's nothing better than referrals because you don't need to sell yourself. They do it for you. Beautiful. There's so many bits that I've enjoyed about this session. I think... I think probably the two standout favourite bits for me were, you know, the referral mm, story, the, the, jobs. The, you know, the reverse, whatever it was that, that we did there. I really like that. Plus, I like the simplicity of that plan, mm. that one big thing, three important areas, five tasks, maybe for each of the three. And I've learned that from an old mentor of mine, Pete Wilkinson. He's known as the 135 business plan. That's where I got it from. And it is, it's simple. It's a one page document that I look at every single day and I make sure I stick to it religiously, non-negotiable. Well, if there's anything salespeople want, it's simplicity. Isn't yes. It? That's meaningful. Yeah, that's totally. Create emotion. Totally. Well, what's been your favorite part? Of today? Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to speak to Brad. Brad Sugars yeah. on the back of your referral. Yeah, nice assumption of... Absolutely. Assumption. Now, what's been mine? I, I just, I enjoy, I've just enjoyed the conversation. You know, it's made me, it's reminded me of certain things that maybe I don't do as often as I should. Um, it goes back to basics. You know, what I notice with the best of the best is they do the basics brilliantly. And it's reminded me of some of the basics that I hope I do most, but I probably don't do all of them. So I think it's given me that kick up the backside to make sure I'm doing all of the things that I talk about. You know, I've, I've interviewed some of the best salespeople on the planet and you've shared some stuff today that I've not heard before. Oh, well, thank you. I'm pleased to hear that. Yeah, yeah so pleased to no, hear that. thank you very much, Tony Morris. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on.